Hey, everybody. Hey, thank you for coming out today. Uh, I want to thank Henry West for inviting me to do this great class. It's an amazing school class. Um, I also want to thank the library for hosting this event. Very excited to be here. Loving all the meetings. Okay. So I'm going to read from We Are the Crisis. It's the second book in the Confederate Saga. Um, if you're not familiar with the series, I pitch it as Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets the wire. <laughs> it's all the, you know, the monster, weirdness of Buffy, and then the, the community-oriented, political, mosaic narrative structure. Um, I'm going to read from the second book. Um, it's really hard to pick something from a sequel that doesn't inspire anything I found. Um, but this part of the book is just the beginning of a school. It's like a teaser of a school, I guess. Um, so I can kind of read. Um, another thing I should say about a session is session is kind of strange. It's um, it's someone interviewing somebody else, and she's recalling a night that she met someone somebody and that that meeting during the meeting that person is recounting a story of meeting another person who's recounting us of meeting with another person. <laughs> uh, and so just just so you prepare for some like uh narrative reception. Okay. Chapter 9 0 5 3 9 Marjorie Cameron grew up strange. Even at a young age, she had a mystical quality about her. This beautiful and her friend will stick to the edges of reality. She would lie awake at night and imagine death, just outside the window, dragging the side behind her. In winter, the trees around her house looked like the skeleton fingers of glass sides sprouting from her. At school, she excelled in art and stereo on windows. Boys thought she was cute, but it didn't linger. Something about her scared them off. Girls thought she was odd, but she managed to keep penises. Nothing particularly damaging happened to her at school. She endured no cruelties at the practice. She was that kind of mess in all those videos, coming in to see what was happening and what was going on, and comments tail streaming up behind her as she left the solar system. She would return beautifully, always. But people learned not to expect much from her beyond her regular appearances. She also excelled in drama club. She sang. Change a smile and a fleeting word. But they don't connect until the next time she appears at his house, pulled back into his orbit by the same friend who invited her the first time. I performed a ritual of summoning, he tells her when she arrives at his house. I knew you'd come. He's handsome. So Cameron entertains this strange comment, curious. I'm pretty sure I brought myself, she says. They sit in his living room, engaging in light flirtation and talking about his interests. I love science fiction, particularly the work of Robert Heinlein, he says. Do you like science fiction? Sure, Cameron says. She has already decided to sleep with him. She isn't delicate about such things. Cameron asks him how he got into the occult the real story, not the one where an angel or some higher being appears to him in his living room. The way most people do, the way you did, I'm sure. I met someone and we had a great conversation. I learned some things, read some books of my own, and then I never stopped. Jack is being presumptuous. Cameron didn't have to meet anyone to discover her own interest. She has a flash of memory, her alone in her bedroom, the sound of death dragging his sight outside her window. He continues talking. He tells Cameron that he works as a, as a rocket technician by day, part of a three-man team he co-founded to work on government contracts, and investigates occultism at night and on the weekends. No, he doesn't see any distinction between physics and metaphysics. They're both the same, really. The universe is still a magic trick, even if you learn its laws. He says, if you're thinking of going deeper, I can guide you further down this rabbit hole, if you like. It is, perf it is a perfectly normal thing for a man like him to say. But Cameron has already lived a full life, worked in intelligence, 
left her little town and guided herself down her own rabbit holes. She doesn't need his guidance. I'd like that, she says. Her laugh starts false and turns real. And while you guide me, I'll show you what I know. You might discover more yourself. He laughs back. Fair enough. I'd like that too. Is it love? Cameron doesn't need it to be. She's interested and thinks she'll be interested for a while. Love starts as a decision. Jack hosts several more gatherings at his house that Cameron is witness to, but one stands out more than the rest. This particular gathering takes place after Jack and Cameron have married. The year is 1946, and it is a large affair. Some of Jack's more open-minded work friends, physicists and engineers with an interest in metaphysical questions, Marjorie's artist friends with similar proclivities, occultists whose interests are more than recreational, a few thelemites of note, and the great man Alistair Crowley himself, the father of the Thelema religion, arriving fashionably late with an expensive bottle of whiskey. This is Cameron's first time seeing the man, and the last. He is short up close, but when he stands anywhere in the room, he towers over everyone. It is like an optical illusion. He grows with distance, and when he's near, people's attentions pull towards him. On several occasions the night of the gathering, Cameron and Crowley are at close quarters, and the people near them become dizzy in their combined presence, split apart. Cameron, by all appearances, does not notice her similar power over people unless she's actively turning on her charm. But even her passive presence attracts people's attention. Crowley will be the man everyone remembers, as is often the case in this era. But Cameron will be a spot of fire in everyone's mind for the rest of their lives. If she appears bright in hindsight, imagine her brightness undimmed by the biases of men. The early part of the night is filled with small talk, people moving around in search of good conversation, but eventually they find their little clusters and hover there as people come and go. Crowley draws a cluster to him, and more and more people, sensing the change in the air, join him. He isn't a particularly interesting conversationalist, Cameron notices. He talks very slowly, as if he must dig each word up out of a pile in the back of his mind. He is soft-spoken, with none of the showy charisma she's seen in Hasper men. Crowley is not handsome. But he has something else, a certain daring. No one can tell where he will go next, and his stories, even when they're dull, have surprises waving around bends. Later in the night, as people tire and drift away, Jack and Cameron linger, along with a handful of other attendees. Everyone is tired, They've been listening for an hour to Crowley's recounting of a conversation with Churchill. But then he shifts, he shifts in his chair and reminisces about his brief history, his brief time in Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. I got into too many arguments, Crowley says. I wasn't stuffy enough, I figure. Had not narrowed myself to one way of thinking. His tenure in the Hermetic Order was short-lived. According to Crowley, the group had been embroiled in heavy infighting for some time forming factions around key personalities. It was a law of mass and action, with so many of the English intelligentsia in, a, in a, such a small space, fractures inevitably began to form. Crowley was certainly at the center of some of the drama. He had an infamous rivalry with Yates that led to its own chasms, William and his cult of the mind and Alistair and his cult of the dark arts. Crowley viewed Yates as a talentless hack and Yates determined to counter the critique with a more scathing one, called Crowley a liar and a fraud of the greatest magnitude. As she listens, Cameron is struck by the high drama of it all. All these great people in the same place. And decades later, in the hospital on the eve of her death, she will smile as she recounts this gathering and this particular point in the night as Crowley sharing gossip from his time in the infamous secret society. When looking at this history from a distance, it is easy to forget just how many famous and infamous people cross over in their lives, Cameron tells me on the night before she dies. But once the dates are compared, the comings and goings of every life in every era, it isn't difficult to draw a straight line of connection with all these key figures, entering and leaving, meeting one famous so-and-so who soon dies and is replaced by another such person who has known so-and-so and had risen to prominence, telling stories of such and such to famous artist Y, who goes, to meet, who goes on to meet revolutionary C, has an awkward interaction with the famous artist W and passes it on to infamous character Q, who starts a school of thought and art 
that will attract artists H, J, and V. From a particular vantage, this can, as some people have said, begin to look like a great play with famous entrances and exits. But the playgoers are sometimes art actors, and everyone eventually dies, keeling over in their seats or backstage or right there on stage. A solid line of passing acquaintances, deep friendships, and vicious rivalries. You know what I mean, right? I nod. I do know what she means, intimately. On the night of the gathering, Crowley continues, I left the group in a bad way, but I, would have, I wouldn't have lingered in any event. The romantic order of the Golden Dawn had no real insights into the great mysteries. But one interesting thing did happen during my time there. The only one that I, will, I still carry with me, a glimpse at a particular great truth. Cameron, on the eve of her death, he's done it again. Caught us all around the bend. The sleep lifts from everyone's eyes. There's a collective leaning in. Crowley, the night of the gathering, I met a poet, incredibly famous for a certain time. I met him at one of the socialization parties. Not much different from one from the one we're at right now. I remember he had big eyes. No, more like he kept his eyes open, wide, trying not to miss anything or scared of everything. Everyone else at those parties was busy presenting a persona. Cameron, on the eve of her death, I thought then, aren't you? And then I thought, was he? Perhaps he was exactly this strange person we were glimpsing. I've seen so many performances myself over the years people presenting a certain idea of themselves. With Crowley, I could not make up my mind. He was, sorry, where was I? Oh, yes. He told us he went over to the poet and Crowley, the night of the gathering. He startled when I began speaking to him. I took him a while, it took him a while to calm down. I got us both drinks from the bar and found a chair away from the noise. Preliminary discussion first. I asked him who he was. I hadn't seen him at one of these things before. I told him I had joined recently. I asked him about his work and he recited some of his poetry. I usually don't have a taste for the kind of poetry that makes a person a name, but I liked his. After the reading, the poet suddenly asked me if I wanted to hear a story and I told him I did. And so, and so do the party guests Crowley has now enraptured. They have been pulled through a tunnel, time and space shrinking before them. Crowley, he said to me, that when he was a younger man, he'd taken a lover, an older man, pale but still in good health. And one night after they made love, the poet's head on this older man's chest, the man told the poet a story. I've lived a long time, the man said. But when I was young, I was part of a secret society. I had an occupation within that society as an indoctrinator. It was through this occupation I learned how to perform transformation. First, get a child. Any child will do, but it must be incredibly young, preferably preverbal, pay a peasant or a woman ready to be rid of her sin, or, and this was my practice, develop relationships with several convents and orphanages, take a suitably young child and lock it away. The old man paused. The poet expected him to take a breath and gather himself, waited for him to do so. The old man did not breathe, and in fact, his chest had been still the entire time the poet was lying there. This should have been a great concern, but the poet was hungry for more information. He said, okay, lock the child away, what else? Why do this? The old man smiled without parting his lips. He said, what I will tell you is a curse. And on that night, long before Cameron's death, long before the party with Crowley, and further back still, on the night the poet lies in his lover's arms, there's a moment when the poet considers stepping back from whatever his lover is going to tell him. And he will remember for many years those final seconds on that precipice between who he is and who he will never be again. But the poet is young, far away from that terrified older version of himself, famous and damned, telling his story to Crowley. So on that night, in his lover's arms, the poet says, tell me. And the old man tells him everything. Cameron, on the eve of her death, going pale from the memory. And Crowley tells us everything. 
Everything the old man says, recounted to Crowley by the poet and recounted to us through Crowley, the whole terrible truth, like an evil game of telephone. We are told that the entire time the poet was talking to Crowley, the poet was terrified, looking everywhere, searching for eavesdroppers, for onlookers, for ghosts. We are all transfixed by this recounting, every eye on this man and failing him. We can tell just by looking. But Crowley's spirit is very alive, and it is the spirit we cling to. And through Crowley, we see the poet's fear, but also the spell the poet was under, the spell we're all now under, glimpsing this deep secret. Only the secret is grotesque in every way. Something shifts in the room with us. The rest of the house is dark, except for a light in the foyer to guide the way out. And despite the light in the room, I can feel the darkness waiting just outside the light and it feels deeper, like a shroud. I find myself praying that the lights don't go out and pray that the darkness doesn't consume us. Crowley, Night of the Gathering. Do that, Crowley says, ending the story. And it is unclear whether these are Crowley's words or the poets. Do that and you can create a monster. Did he try it? A man in the back asks. Within months, this man will become close friends with Jack and Cameron, and they'll give him the nickname Ace. Crowley says, of course he did. And have you, Ace asks. Crowley doesn't answer. Thank you. So the, the question, uh, and tell me if I'm right, is how do I decide which perspectives to, to gravitate towards or to include? Um, I mean, the honest answer is just like curiosity. Like, you know, I'm, I'm never sure if it's the right perspective to, um, to choose, but I think like if I'm, if I'm curious enough and I'm passionate enough about the perspective, then that comes through um, and I find something. Um, um, my first, when I was working on my first novel in my MFA, uh, it started off with one story. I was telling a story of um, um, this young, this this um, um, young adult guy who's working for an alien ambassador, and um, he had a younger sister. He had upstairs neighbors. He has a, he had a grandmother that was really tough on him, and I just got curious about those characters to start right. And I I wrote a story from the the little sister's perspective. And I wrote a story from the grandmother's perspective that was really um, interesting and fun to do, getting into that voice. Um, and I just kept opening doors that way. So like every time I would find somebody in the network of people, I got interested and I would work on something from that perspective. And then slowly, gradually over time, a story began to emerge. I've been more like, um, like, um, I've been more intentional now, you know, when I think about it, but um, that early, um, that early project was just, it was organic. I just kind of found where I was going to go in the dark and then made sense of it after the fact. I wonder if I should say that. <laughs> the honest answer because this, this is all life no 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 um so honestly honestly um for i worked for amazon for a year i worked for amazon um alexa so like that like little ai assistant and i had like a group of friends in that job and when we were done doing stuff man I feel like they're gonna come for me. Um, when we were done working, <laughs> we would we would have conversations and we would kind of go down um, Wikipedia rabbit holes because we would have to do that to kind of verify um, Alexa's brain, right? Um, so we were doing that anyway. And so occasionally someone would ask a really interesting question and we would find uh, the Wikipedia article or an article online that would like correspond to the question or try to answer that question. And I don't know how it began, but I got really interested. I think it started with like um, Scientology and the weird things, that, weird conspiracy things they would do. And from there, it kind of like was like this, like, um, I don't know, like 
um, evil game of telephone, right? Like where I got I got interested in L. Ron Hubbard, and then I got interested in Jack Parsons and um, and and that that secret society that he was a part of, and then I got interested in Hormetic Order and Golden Dawn. There's like this whole like thread of secret. I sound crazy. There's a thread of like secret societies that connect. Right. So there's like this long line of connections, right? And, and Cameron talks about this in the section. She's talking about like, you know, this person goes on to do this and talk to this person. Um, and so I just got interested and I just followed the rabbit hole as far as it went or as far as I would dare. Right. And then I, <laughs> Gosh. Um, there's a, the, there's a character in this um, named Ace and he shows up again later on and Ace is, is L. Ron Hubbard, um, but I, I I covered it up because I was terrified, you know. Um, so yeah, I I don't know. I got I got curious, and then I, I just kept getting curious, and then you know because I'm writing a story about um, secret monster societies, it just felt like it would it would be a really cool idea to fit that history of monstrosity in with the his the, the true history, right, or the true is true ish history. Yeah. Um, anything particularly weird? Um, I mean, I don't know. It's not a surprise to anybody that like some of these people were like really racist, like, you know what I mean? Um, and so it was like secret society racism, weird things like they wanted, um, um, Margie Cameron is much nicer in the book than, um, like her actual person. She like believed in like making moon children, which were like, um, like intentionally like bringing all the races together to make higher beings it's it's weird stuff um and so i kind of just like like backed away from that and presented a different version of marjorie like what if marjorie in this particular universe is like you know a nicer person and it doesn't like you know embrace you know weird these weirder stuff um so yeah that i think is the weirdest thing is kind of like reading program thing that you know i like don't want to get into details it's just weird it's just really weird um so yeah i mean all the things that like i was reading on like scientology and what they were being what they were doing um that's that stuff is also really weird um so yeah i mean i i feel like one of the things that i decided pretty early on was to just take as much as i needed and make the real weird stuff, stuff that I invented instead. So there's like a thing, this is a setup to something that's quite disturbing. Um, it's implied in this, you know, has to do with like how to create a monster from a child. And it's really dark, um, but that stuff is made up. Oh, did I study tarot while I was doing this? Yeah. No, I didn't. Should I? <laughs> Okay, so the question is, what would be the best research book for, for like studying the occult? Is uh, for Crowley's order. Oh well, I mean, there's a there's a book called Secret Agent Six Six Six. That's about Crowley. I'd recommend that. Um, it's kind of like a, it's not just about his work in like um the various orders he was um a part of, but also about like stuff he was doing with like MI six and. You know, weird. I mean, this stuff is just like weirder than fiction. Um, so yeah, I would recommend that to check out. Um, yeah, I do want to get into tarot, um, but I don't. I just don't know where to start. So maybe I should ask you after this. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a support group I have um, I started during um, the pandemic um, and we actually before the pandemic we used to meet at coffee shops there was like a, I was living in Boston at the time and a lot of this um, project is set in Boston in the Boston area um, and I would we would go to coffee shops and we would write and we would we would check in with each other and talk about like we didn't like share the work but we would talk about the work um, and get encouragement from each other um, 
And when the pandemic happened, we had to we had to stop meeting in public. And so we um, started a Discord um, called the Cambridge Writing Friends. And we would meet um, for a while there. We would meet every morning. And we would um we would start with talking. We would just talk to each other. Then we would write for like an hour or two, and then we would talk to each other again. Sometimes we would share gossip. You know, it was it was all kinds of stuff, right? And then we would share links to things and things we were thinking about and recommendations. Um, now um, we 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 do most of it on the weekend because we've all like moved on and lives and all kinds of stuff. And so we still meet on the weekends. And most of the time when we meet on the weekends, we will talk for like we'll get on at like 10 a.m. and we'll talk for like a few hours and then we would we'll break for lunch having not written anything but we will promise each other to have written something and to update each other later in the day and we sometimes do and, and sometimes we don't do anything and we'll be like we didn't I didn't do anything um, um and then occasionally we'll we'll check in and we'll we'll get to work we'll manage to like pull ourselves together and get to work and so that has been really helpful to me like I haven't shared like like drafts of things with them but we do talk about things um and and when i can if i if we if there's something that i want them to look at i'm like could you look at this and tell me if this is working and they'll you know someone in the group will be happy to do that and that's been really great Man. okay so the question is what is the coolest monster i've written into a story and what's the coolest monster i have yet to write into a story Oh, um, I don't know the answer to the second question. I mean, I I kind of um, I'm kind of interested in the Wendigo, um, but I don't know how to do that appropriately. So like it's it's one of those things where I'm like I'm like stepping carefully with that, um, but I'm interested. Um, the the coolest monster, I mean, the coolest real monster that I've I've written into a story is the Sukuyant or the um, the Sukunya, which is like a like a Caribbean vampire kind of a selkie like it's like it's a vampire that it's like a vampire like creature that removes its skin and and sucks blood um and and tends to in in the mythology like suck babies blood um but the one that i wrote i kind of combined a bunch of different myths from a bunch of different caribbean places like some of sometimes um the creature will fly through the air as a ball of fire and I just thought that was really cool. That was not part of the story that I've been told um, in you know in the Virgin Islands where I'm from, um, but that was really neat. So I was like, well, I'm including that. Um, and then I kind of like took some liberties um, with with how it works because like when she when she takes off her skin, she's invisible. And I'm not sure that's exactly true, but it's um it's it is an invention of mine, right? Yeah. Um, it, it could be, I, I, I don't know, but I have a suspicion it's not. Anyway, um, I, I, I made it up. Okay, the one, the one that I made up and it's really not, I didn't make it up. Um, it's, it's just a, um, a shifter, it's a, it's a dragon shifter. It's a, a boy named Dragon and he shifts into a dragon sometimes. And I think it's really neat. But that's not like, I mean, there's tons of examples of that as well. Um, but I just like my particular dragon boy. Um, so yeah, those are the those are the ones. Oh, okay. So the question is, how far do I plan to extend? And the answer is one more and never again. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's gonna be a trilogy. Um, I someone should have warned me that that's a hard thing to do. Um, trilogies are really it's painful because then you I mean like the, the fun thing about the first book is that you set up all of this really great stuff you're just like ah and then you kind of like laugh maniacally I'm like I'm gonna have this happen um and you, you're just you're so naive because because then you have to pay that off you have to you have to close that thread and so one of the things that happens in Ogazo Monsters is like I open a bunch of threads and I'm like and then we had a crisis I I I do the crazy thing, which is I open more threads and close none of them. <laughs> um, and so the last book is just like half the book. I've, I've, I'm like working on revisions right now. I it's due in August and um, I'm terrified. Um, but 
half of the book is just resolving threads. It's just like, oh, we got to put that in and resolve that thread. And I'm like, could I could I resolve two threads at the same time? And it's really <laughs> painful. Um, so I I I'm saying I'll never do it again, but I feel like this is like famous last words or something, and I'll end up doing something again. Um, so yeah, this but this is gonna end after book three. It's it's ended. <laughs> I, I think I prefer I, I think I prefer short stories because you you can you can finish them right like, <laughs> like I've I've failed at novels enough times to be like you know like wary um, and the best I mean like even when I'm working on novels I tend to think of them structurally as as parts that you assemble because that gets me through it right like I, I complete a thing and then I complete another thing and then I complete another thing and then um, eventually there's a novel, but short stories are really satisfying because you can like work on one and you can see the end and you can arrive at the end. And some with, with novels, you kind of like, there's always a point in a novel process where you lose hope. Um, and that it's just, it's it's just it's just really painful. It's you you doubt yourself and you have to you have to recommit and then you have to fail and then you have to recommit again. It's it's it asks a lot. It's like an endurance test. Um, but when it's done, it's really satisfying. But I find that even when I'm done, I can pick up any of the books that I finished and flip to a page and be pissed off by something. <laughs> um, I'm like, how did I let that go? And it's because you get so tired you stop caring. <laughs> okay, so the question, I, I don't think I've been consistent with this, I apologize. Um, the, the question is, um, I have a background in linguistics, sort of, a little bit. Um, and the question is, has that made it into my writing? And, and I mean, when I started the linguistics, so I did the linguistics degree while I was getting my MFA, which is not advisable. Um, I started MFA and then I took a linguistics class and then I got really interested in ling the linguistics class. And then I was like, I should take more of these classes. And then I was like, I should get a degree. Um, and at the time, no one had done that. And they were like, your funeral. So I, I did it. And, um, but the one of the reasons I did it was because I was interested in, I was working on a project that was set in the Virgin Islands on St. Thomas. And I know the dialect, but I didn't want to take for granted that I knew how to do it responsibly on the page. Um, and so I, I, I started taking linguistics classes to kind of get closer to that, to kind of like think about it analytically. And so I went home and I did like, I interviewed like, um, like 25 people from back home and I did various like linguistics projects with the, with the data. But one of the things that it helped me do was think about like how fluid language Languages, and that came into the, the book. So um, I thought a lot about like, um, and I was I was talking to one of the students up there about this, um, how you know back home there's like a there's like a standard Saitomian English that is different than standard American English, and then under that there's multiple registers of Englishes. There's um, like a middle Saitomian English, and then there's like a street Saitomian English, right? Like it's the most like colloquial one. And that most people, um, they float around on the spectrum of those Englishes. They don't stay in one place. And that they use it um, for, for like political and social and cultural reasons. Like if you're, if you're at work, you kind of hover at the, at the Saitomian standard English. If you are at home, you kind of, you know, you may be in the middle, you may be lower. If you're like hanging out with friends, you may be lower. And then it's also tied to emotion. And so that kind of stuff um, was the most like important thing that I picked up from studying linguistics. And then the other thing that I picked up was um, like not exotifying the language, right? Like the politics of like writing a dialect, like and not like doing like things like I dialect, like spelling it the way you think it sounds. And so I would I would lean more on the vocabulary of St. Thomian English and the, the grammar of St. Thomian English over spelling things strangely, unless 
if I spelled it like the standard way, the meaning would be lost. The, the example I use is like Pana. We say like that Pana over there. Um, and Pana means like, if you, if you put that in standard, it's partner, but then I would sound like a cowboy, right? <laughs> and so it has like its own meaning and its own context. And it, then it has to be spelled differently. And so I would spell it differently in that case. And so like those kinds of like, you know, navigating those kinds of decisions was one of the things that I got out of linguistics, for sure. All right, so the question is, what got me into speculative writing and <laughs> um, and um, what drew me to it? Um, so when I was when I was a kid, I thought I wanted to be a scientist, and I think it was because I was like interested in how the world worked. It wasn't just like like natural science. It was kind of like I was interested in like society. Right? And I was like, why do we do things the way we do? What, you know, like I was interested in culture, not having the word for culture. Um, and then like when I was in high school, I read um, 1984 by George Orwell, um, which people don't usually frame as a speculative novel. They kind of frame it as like a literary classic, but it's a speculative novel, it's a dystopian. Um, and so, and it was my first time reading something that was speculative like that, that was like truly speculative. And it was about politics. And I, I got excited by that. I mean, first I got depressed. It's a really depressing novel. Um, but then I got excited. And um, I, I was like, oh, this is something that I could maybe do. And, but it wasn't until I read The Dispossessed by um, Ursula Le Guin that it really, like it gave me the courage to kind of like, you know, write, you know, speculative fiction and think about like using speculative fiction to answer questions about societies and, uh, and um, um, you know, challenge authority and think about systems, that kind of stuff. And so I think I'm gravitated, I gravitate towards it because it allows you to do those things directly and indirectly at the same time, right? And kind of get under people's defenses while you're doing it directly and indirectly. You know, you can kind of create a whole nother world or a whole nother context or set something in the future to challenge a particular idea. Um, and people will receive it better than if you try to, you know, do that like in in the in literary fiction. But I also just think it just gives you more freedom to imagine better um, or imagine different. You know, it, you're not limited by being close to or near reality. And I just I find that like really exciting and empowering. And, you know, um, cool. Does anything help? So the question is, how do I go about? Um, doing revisions and does anything help? And I mean, like, how much time do we have? <laughs> I, I mean, my my process for doing it has changed a lot over time. Um, oh man, it, what I do now is I kind of like um, create I create um, um, PDFs of the of the drafts and I um, I put it on this like. I have a paper tablet. It helps with my ADHD um, to not do it on a computer. And, and then I just go in and I mark, I mark up the, the manuscript. Um, and then I, then I edit on the computer the things I marked up. And then I do that again, like 12 times, which is like, I mean, it doesn't seem like a smart way to do it, but I feel like, the thing that it does help me do is it helps me to not fixate and get stuck in like a vortex of revising one page. But I feel like I would get stuck for hours on a page if I didn't do it this way. And so I, I kind of, the way I think about it is like, I'll fix what I can see. And then when there's too much marked up on the page, I can't see anything anymore. So like, I'll just move on. And then um, I'll do that again, right? And I'll just, I'll, I'll leave problems for future revisions. So like, I think that the way that helps me the best is just like thinking about it as rounds and like, it, like you can get through this round and then see how you feel. And if something bugs me, then I, then I do it again. And then I get through that round and I keep doing it until I'm no longer annoyed by what's on the page. And then eventually I read it later and then I'm annoyed again. So I don't know what happens in the interim. Um, but that's my process. Um, and I feel like that helps. I feel like if you can give yourself, um, if you can give yourself one project for a revision, that helps a lot. Like if this is, this is my, 
I'm doing cleanup. This is my cleanup revision. I'm just making sure the sentences are actually sentences and not like junk. And then the next, the next one is like, I'm making sure that things are consistent from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, right? Like things are true and they're always true throughout the draft. And then I'm um, making sure that like, um, I like the words. And then I'm making sure I really like the words, you know, and, and, and so forth. And I think that helps. Um, but I, I haven't figured out a process that I don't change. I, I keep changing them. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the answer is yes, I do. I do reading aloud. I also do a thing. I don't know. I don't know if it's embarrassing to admit this. I do speech to text. I, I sometimes have a robot um, read to me in my ears as I'm looking at the page because that helps with my fatigue. Like if I feel like I'm getting tired, um, that's really helpful for me. Like having, having a voice inside of my head that I have to keep following. And then if, and it, it helps me find the places where I'm getting stuck too. Like if I get stuck on something, it's because the, the, the voice reader, um, hits something that I don't like. Right. And so I, I do that. And then sometimes I read aloud. Um, and then you find other things when you read aloud. The, the thing that you find when you read aloud is like flow stuff, like certain things look good on the page, but then when you read it, it sounds unnatural. And so that will help me with adjusting things that seem unnatural. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.